All right, we are ready for our second unit, which is ecology, and this first video is just going to be on population ecology. It is from the beginning of chapter 53 in your book, so as you go through this video with me, write in your notes, and then go back to chapter 53 and fill in your Cornell notes. So, first thing we want to talk about in population ecology are the levels of organization. How do you look at an area and decide what it belongs to? So, we're going to start off with the simplest, which is one individual. So, if I think about Spencer Port, I'm going to look at one squirrel. That would be one individual. If I want to look at a population, my next level, that would be all of the squirrel species that are in that area. So, just one species. If I look at a community, I am now looking at all the biotic organisms, every species that lives in that area. So the squirrel population and the deer population and the bear population and the oak tree population and the grass population, any living thing in that area. If I go to ecosystem, I now want to take into consideration everything that's not alive. What's the temperature? How much water does it get? What's the humidity? What's the pH of the soil? All of those factors are called abiotic factors, the non-living factors. So when you take into consideration abiotic and biotic, you are now looking at the ecosystem. A biome, you can think of a biome as a tropical rainforest or here a temperate, um, temperate deciduous forest, or you could look at a taiga or a tundra, grassland, all of those are examples of biomes. They have very typical, predictable weather patterns and predictable um, living things. Flora are the plant life, fauna are the animal life. You can predict the flora and the fauna of a biome. Above that, the largest level, when we take everything into consideration, is called the biosphere. So everything on Earth and its atmospheres. All right. Let's go into the properties. When you talk about a population, so let's say a population of squirrel, we are going to look at, first of all, what's the size? How many individuals are there? We call that N. We're looking at N, the number of squirrels. So let's say there are 3,000 squirrel in Spencer Port. That is its size. The next one is density. Density means, well, if we have 3,000, what kind of a space are we talking about? 3,000 in an acre would be ridiculous. 3,000 in 500 acres or 5,000 acres, what is the amount of land that those squirrel occupy? So that is our density. Density is often gathered through sampling techniques. So I'm going to go over a math formula that we use to determine density. And it allows you to calculate how many organisms there are in an area. It's called mark and recapture. So I'm going to stand over here because I feel like I'm blocking it. It says they're gathered through sampling techniques where organisms are captured, tagged, and then released. And then they go back a second time, capture, and they count up how many already have tags on them. Here is the formula that is used. It's called the mark and recapture method. N is equal to, so we're trying to get the size of the population, the number in the first catch times the number in the second catch, and we're going to divide that by the number of recaptures that we found in that second catch. So this is a mathematical calculation. We will do plenty of practice ones during class together. All right, our next um, population thing that we're going to look at is dispersion. Dispersion means how are the organisms in that population spaced out. The first and most common of all is clumped. To find things grouped together is extremely common. And if you think about it for a second, why are they clumped? It's usually around a resource. Even cities are clumped. People clump around bodies of water. So here we have organisms showing a clumped dispersion. Um, safety in numbers is another reason why they're clumped. Clumped around resources. And here are some examples. Any patch of a plant so where you see a patch where there are several of the same type of plant growing in one area, a colony of ants, weeds on the edge of a field. Next dispersion type is uniform. Uniform usually indicates either that something has been planted in that way 
or it might indicate that that organism releases a chemical and that chemical spreads out and only allows organisms to be a certain distance close to it. So maybe due to resource usage, might be due to competition, might be due to toxins or chemicals released. So trees planted in a forest, Christmas tree farm, those are very uniformly spread. Nesting beach birds or animals that are territorial often also have a range in which they live, so you will see it repeated like that. The third is random. So random means there's nothing that's really drawing those organisms close to each other or away from each other. It's just random where you end up seeing them. So trees in a forest, if they're not planted, generally pretty random. They're not clumped because clumped wouldn't allow them to get enough light or enough water, but they're usually spread out in a random way. I have some um, examples here. So if you look at this, think about it for a second, clumped. Definitely clumped. They are all so close together. These are um, a type of caterpillar and they're on a leaf here. Here we have a type of cactus. Look at that for a second. That is evenly spread out. I don't know if you can see so well from there, but this type of cactus actually releases a chemical, so it is uniform dispersion. It's actually pretty evenly spread out because the toxins produced by the cactus won't allow another to grow within a certain distance of it. All right, survivorship. This is our next um, study of a population. We want to look at how, um, how long do they live, when are they most likely to die. So there are three parts of the curve. And I want you to draw this in your notes. Draw the curve. We've got the number of survivors over their lifespan. Here is curve one. Here is curve two, and here is curve three. And you'll notice these are Roman numerals. Number one has very low death rates when they're young. So like humans, chances are you are going to survive until you're old. And when you're old, chances are you're going to die. Do people die when they're young? Do people die at middle age? Absolutely. But the percentage of the population usually is highest until an older age. So we are a type 1. Type 2, equal chance of dying really at any point in your life. You can die when you're young, you can die in the middle, you can die at the end. We think of birds, mice, rodents, things like that. There's a, sort of an equal chance of dying at any point in your life. That is curve 2. So if I fill these in again, curve 1 was here, curve 2 is here, and curve 3 is here. All right, curve 3. You have a much greater chance of dying when you're young than when you are old. So things that are very common for this, think of a maple tree. Maple tree has those little helicopter seeds, and those helicopter seeds, one single tree might release millions of them. Chances are millions aren't going to grow up. The majority of them are going to be run over with a lawnmower and destroyed or eaten or something happens to them. They start growing and then there's not enough light, there's not enough water in the soil, they don't make it. Um, maybe a few of them that are able to fly far enough away might survive. So very few live longer, most die when they're young. Those are survivorship curves. All right, age structure. So I'm not looking at survivorship now, I'm looking at age. How is the age of a population distributed? Are the majority of people young? Are the majority of people old? And the reason why we look at this age structure curve is it tells us a lot about population growth. Is the population getting wiped out? Or is the population about to go through a boom and really increase in size? If there is no growth whatsoever, we call that ZPG. Zero population growth, where it is exactly staying the same. If you look at these for a little bit, the one that is very um, straight here is a stable population. Your youngest organisms are on the bottom, your oldest organisms are on the top, and in the middle are what we call the reproducers. These are the ones that are having babies now, and then of course we think of these pre-reproductive, that's what we want to look at and say, okay, who's coming up because what's the next generation going to bring us? So right away, this one, there's a lot of pre-reproducing, which means this population is growing. 
it's going to increase because as these go to here, the section of the graph will be wider, and as they go up, that will be wider. So it's showing growth. If you look over here, your reproductive age is good, but the pre-reproductive age has gone down, which means that there will be less um, organisms born in the future. So this population size is decreasing. You can predict what's going to happen to a population size by looking at these age structure diagrams. Oh, I just thought this was interesting. So if you look, one of the most drastically expanding populations on the planet, it's India. We used to think it was China, and it was China, but now it's really India. India is so overpopulated, and if you look at it, here's why. Few old people, many reproductive, and younger than reproductive people. And when you see the two sides, that usually is to show how many males versus how many females. So over here, um, it's pretty common in India, the same ratio, 50-50. In China, there's usually more males than females, um, because they limited who could have babies and who could survive. But this population tends to be um, staying more stable right now, whereas this population is definitely still growing. All right, number three. So we have looked at the levels of organization. We've looked at some things that we use to describe a population. Now we're going to look at how do populations grow. So this type of growth, where you start off with very few organisms and it shoots way up. You think of bacteria, something that very quickly goes from just a few bacteria to a lot, that's when you get sick. So that type of growth is called exponential growth. It makes a J curve. It's unrestrained or unrestricted growth. No predation, no parasitism, no competition. Grow, 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 grow. Now the problem is organisms that undergo exponential growth there's an option right when you hit this point. It's either the population is about to crash because it's going to run out of resources, or maybe it's going to reach more of a stable point. And if it reaches a stable point, we call that point the carrying capacity. Here is an example. Here's bacteria. Here's their growth. And here's simply a data table that shows you at zero minutes, we had one. In 20 minutes, it doubled itself. In 40 minutes, doubled itself again. And so within 220 minutes, we went from one bacteria to 2,048 bacteria. Definitely exponential growth. All right, logistic growth. If something is logistic, you think logical. Makes a little bit more sense. It reaches a carrying capacity. It is a sigmoid curve, and a sigmoid curve makes an S like that. That's what sigmoid means. So up here, this is my carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is known as K. And it has reached its maximum growth rate, and it stays there. So here is the steepest point. So that's where I have the most growth. And um, it, you could look at the growth at any point by calculating slope. All right, my next one, showing this carrying capacity. Carrying capacity with the letter K. That's showing the number of organisms that can live in an area at a time. So if we talk about squirrels again, the carrying capacity for um, out back by the pond, that might be 500 squirrel. That means that's the maximum number of organisms that would be able to survive in that area based on the resources and the amount of land and all of the, the limiting factors that it uses in that area. So here's my population. Starts out going up, 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 and then it reaches a carrying capacity. Now, what is much more likely is you see a wiggle like this. This wiggle or squiggle, that is, that's showing reality. Chances are it's not going to stay at a constant value, but the environment's going to change. There's going to be good days, bad days, good seasons, bad seasons. Oh, we go through a drought, it goes down a little. Oh, we go through a, a time where water is abundant, food is abundant, the population goes up a little higher. So that's why we usually see this here. When you see this, we can call that equilibrium. It has reached a pretty stable state. Wow, this is the human population. We are exponential. Yes, we have grown over time with this drastic J-shaped curve, and it really doesn't seem to make sense. 
and you can just think of it as sort of like a warning. How long will we be able to keep reproducing and exponentially growing before we run out of resources? <coughs> All right. When you think about resources, you can't help but think about this. I'm sure you recognize that. Limiting factors. What are those things that, that limit how big your population can get? There are two types of limiting factors that we talk about. Density dependent. Density dependent means it matters how many organisms you have. These are things that are biotic. As you have food available, you can only have so many things. So food is a factor that it definitely depends on how many organisms you have. I could use an example as easy as this room. If I brought in cupcakes, well, I have 20 cupcakes. Is that factor dependent on how many organisms are in the room? Absolutely. If I have a class of 25 of you, uh, some are going hungry. What if I brought in 25 cupcakes for the whole school? Many are going to go hungry. So it definitely depends on the size of the population. Buildup of waste. We do not think of waste as being biotic, but they're coming from organisms. Waste that you release. Urine that you release is a nitrogenous waste and it's toxic. Ammonia is the base of all nitrogenous waste. So because it's coming from an organism and it's coming from a metabolic process, it's considered biotic. Predation. How many predators are there out there? Disease. Disease is alive. It's usually a, a virus, a bacteria, or a fungus that is infecting your body. So those factors are limiting um, how many organisms can survive and it definitely depends on the size of the population. The second type is density independent. That means it will affect the population no matter the number. A fire. A fire will affect a population of 5 or 500. It doesn't matter. If there's a fire in that area, it's affecting the members of the population and size is irrelevant. So that's called density independent. All right, growth patterns. There's two different strategies that populations undergo. They're either an R-selected strategist or a K-selected strategist. An R-strategist, the population grows exponentially. So right away, R, think reproducers. So I have it right there on the first line. Think R for reproduction. They have many young. They usually just reproduce once. Little or no parenting investment. The young are extremely small and they reproduce at a very young age. Think right away of examples like fruit fly, bacteria, butterfly, fish. Those are perfect R strategists. They are great at, at the beginning of succession. If an area is just beginning growth, usually it's your R strategists that are your pioneer organisms. <clears throat> the second type is more like us. We're K strategists. We take a long time to grow and a long time to reproduce. So population grows to reach the carrying capacity. We undergo that sigmoid curve, logistical growth. Have few young, very large young comparatively, extensive parenting, mature slowly, reproduce several times, might take a long time to get to our reproductive age, and examples humans and elephants. All right, the last thing I have here for today is a case study of population growth. And this actually is right out of your book. And it's looking at when you look at two populations and how they affect each other, you can actually see amazing fluctuations that parallel. And when they parallel each other, um, this example is of lynx and hare, I believe. Yeah, the lynx population, so a lynx, a wild cat, and a hare, a wild rabbit. As the hair population increases, that is food for the lynx. So the lynx population starts to increase. As the lynx population increases, they're eating the hair, so the hair population starts to go down. Less food is now available, so the lynx population goes down. If there's less predator, wow, now my prey population can go back up, causing this to go back up. So you get the idea. It's like those roller coasters that follow each other. That is a perfect example of looking at population growth and doing a case study between a predator and a prey. <coughs> All right, I want to stop there for today. I want you to go back through, look at chapter 53, read it, add examples, things that you have questions about. Make sure that you um, indicate with little question marks in your 
um, regular notes section, circle key terms, underline, highlight, whatever is going to help you to revisit and repeat the information so you understand it better. We'll be doing several of the activities during class to strengthen that understanding of this information.